Hi everyone, welcome to lecture 14. In this lecture we're going to talk about plotting functions and solution sets to equations and the various tools that we have available to do that. And there are many tools available to do that. So the first thing I'd like to talk about is how we work in two dimensions. And as in many cases we've seen so far in this class that a particular problem may have many solutions that Mathematica has available. and in the case of plotting a function, the structure of the function is going to dictate which approach you take to plotting it in two or three dimensions. So if we start by thinking about two dimensions, most of the time so far in this course when we've visualized things we've used the command plot. So plot is a command that's very useful when you have a function of the form y equals f of x. It's the sort of standard form for functions with the plot command. So the structure of the plot function is something that we've already seen. Uh, we build a plot, we have a function, uh, we can give it a range. One thing that we haven't spent a lot of time with is the various options that you can feed into plot. So we've talked a little bit about the things that come up in plot style, like the color that you choose. So we could make this plot gray if we wanted to, or red, or we could choose a hue to go in here instead. So you know, if you want to pick a hue, we could do that. 0.3. Okay. But there's other things we can put into plot style as well. So if you have lots of commands that you want to feed into a function like plot style, you can surround the, uh, the options with braces and then feed lots of options in. So you might tell Mathematica that you would like to have a dashed line, in which case the function will become dashed. Um, there's other options you can take as well. So there's an option called opacity, which will let you specify the amount to which uh, images that lay underneath the plot will show through. You can set a plot background, you can set a plot label, we'll see more of those as we go on. But the idea here is that the real power of these plot type commands is the number of options that we have available to modify the um, object that we're after. In particular, one that we'll see a little bit later is this one, which is plot points. So for now, I'm just going to point out that what plot points does is it specifies the number of points that the function samples to construct the graph that you're working on. And the default is, I think, 50. But you can set that to be lower or higher depending on the precision that you're after and how quickly the computation is running. So if we set a two-point plot, we're not going to get a very accurate graph here because you end up with these sharp lines and squiggles all over the place. So the next function we'll talk about is parametric plot. So parametric plot works best for parametric equations, which are equations where we have x of t and y of t, so that the points are being described as functions of an independent variable t. Oftentimes these functions are thought of paths of objects moving through space. So parametric plot has the same kind of structure that plot does, except when we feed it x's and y's, we have to tell it that there is actually an x and a y wrapped together in a list. So it's an easy oversight to miss here that you have to put the braces on a parametric plot. Okay. So of course you can do things with parametric plot that you could never do with plot because plot assumes a function. Parametric plot assumes a curve that's being traced out in R2. And so you can get things like these nodding patterns. If you want to deal with functions that are defined implicitly, we're going to use a special case of a much more powerful function called contour plot. So we're not going to go into the bigger applications of contour plot at the moment, but the for us the important thing is that contour plot is where the implicit plotting functionality of Mathematica lives. So if you have an implicitly defined function, in this case we're looking at the function x to the third minus x squared minus y squared is equal to zero. I haven't solved this explicitly for y or x because to do so would involve square roots and plus or minuses, but I can still create a contour plot where I look at the relation between x and y implicitly defined by the equation, and then I have to give it x and y values that I can plot this within. So that, of course, can be varied. You could set this to be 2 to 2, and 2 to 2, and of course you're going to get a bigger picture. One thing that you might notice in this graph is that this curve is self-intersecting, and you might wonder where that happens. The techniques that we'll use to do that we'll get in the next lecture. So that's the solve package of commands rather than the graphics command of packages. You should notice here that you might want to have axes explicitly in this graph, and you can always turn on your axes by just 
telling it that you would like the axes to be on. And that's an easy way to get X, Y uh, axes in here. Again, like I said, all these plots have a lot of options that you can turn on to present your, your graph in whatever level of detail that you're after. If you're working with inequalities instead of equalities, you can use a command called region plot. Regions are defined by inequalities against functions. So when you're graphing a region, uh, what you're at, when you're doing a region plot, what you're looking at is a family of inequalities that you're stitching together. And then the region plot, or what region plot will do is it will shade all of the regions that satisfy all of the conditions that you fed into the function. So if you have a single curve that defines two regions, so for example, this equation, or inequality, which says x to the fourth plus x minus two y squared is greater than or equal to zero, on the window from you know uh, the square from negative two to two, then region plot is going to trace out the solution set to that. You can use region plot for compound equations as well. So here's you know an easy example would be something like region plot, and then you can feed it something like suppose that you want x plus y to be greater than or equal to one. And also you would like 2x minus y to be less than or equal to 2. And you're looking to solve this equation for the same square that we started with. When you do your region plot, you will get this overlapped region, which is going to be the set that solves both equations simultaneously. So you can see that right here in this triangle where the two sets overlap. Finally, uh, one of the everyone's favorite sections of calculus is polar plotting, polar calculus. So here we have functions, but they're not functions y of x, they're functions r of t. So where t is an angle in this case. So you have an angle that's input and a radius comes out. So we're thinking of all, all this in polar coordinates. So if you want to impose polar coordinates onto an equation, you use polar plot. And when you do that, the input variable, no matter what you call it, is going to be interpreted as an angle. So here's the polar plot of 2 minus 3 cosine 2t. It's kind of a cool shape because you get this, this hourglass figure. This is too big, so we can bring it back. So a cool figure. Would not be easy to plot by hand, I don't think. Or maybe so, if you remember your tables where you have to fill all the angles and the zeros and then sweep the curve. Uh, these are much easier to visualize in Mathematica. So let's talk about multiple plots. And multiple plots are something that have come up a couple times in the class already as well. My preferred method is to work with the show command where I will build a bunch of individual plots inside of a table or inside variables. And then once I have all the individual plots constructed, then I will put them all together with show which is what I've done right here. So this is the family of graphs corresponding to x to the i, where i runs from 0 to 5. This would be part of a demo, for example, in a calculus, calculus class to illustrate that when you are to the left of x is equal to 1, that the higher the power you are, the smaller you are. But to the right of x minus 1, the higher the power is, the bigger you are. So. Um, you could also introduce color. Oh, what I wanted to point out about this was that what I've built is a table of plots. The table is perfectly willing to construct a list of plots. The plots themselves get created and stored inside that table. And then what show does is it stitches it all together into one figure. Now you might want to put color in here to distinguish between the plots. This is a trick I've used in several of the demos that I've done for the class already. If you construct plots in a table, you can set a color and then have that color vary with the index of the table. So as the numerator of the um, as the index increases, the numerator of the hue increases as well, and that's going to shift the colors as you go down. Another common approach is that you can actually use plot to do several plots simultaneously. So in for, the, for example here, you can plot multiple functions simultaneously as long as they have the same domain, and then all of the options that you choose will apply to all of those functions that you've graphed. So here, we're plotting simultaneously the function sine of 1 over x squared minus x, and also the function 1.5 over x on the domain 0 to pi. And then there's various... Uh, options that have been added on here. We've got a frame around the plots that's in here. We have frame labels. So you can see, if we zoom in on this a little bit, you can see that over here you have the x-axis and the y-axis. Um, it looks like 
maybe the background is not working totally correctly, but this is an idea of the sorts of options that you have available when you're working with plot. Again, because I like to tweak individual plots, typically when I'm doing compound plots, I like to do them separately. Um, I, should, I should point out here, you can also do things like P1 is equal to a plot. So you can just explicitly hold it in a variable. So let's plot X squared, say from X is equal to minus one to two. So we don't need to see that, but there it is. And then I could also plot uh, P2, which I can say is the plot, say, of x to the third from x from minus one to two. And then once I have those plots stored inside those variables, I can just show them with something like show P1, P2. A pretty typical sort of approach to stitching together multiple plots. Okay, so that's three different ways of doing multiple plots. So we've covered two dimensions pretty thoroughly, at least at a surface level. So let's take a look at what the case is in three dimensions. So in three dimensions, uh, we have a lot of power, but a lot of technical difficulty if you want to do start doing really complicated stuff with three dimensional plots, because there's ways, for example, of tracing functions on surfaces. So two dimensional curves on surfaces, contour lines, flow lines on top of a surface. But that involves using something called mesh functions that we're not going to go into. If you're interested in how mesh functions work, you're more than welcome to talk to me about that in office hours or independently. So we're just going to just scratch the surface of the different options that we have available for 3D plots. The basic workhorse of plotting in three dimensions is plot3d, which is just the corresponding function to plot in two dimensions. This is going to presume that we have a function z, which is a function of x and y. So the height of the surface is going to be dictated by some position in the xy plane. And when you have that, it just works exactly like it does in two dimensions, but now we have to add another dimension in here, of course. I will say that in many cases in Mathematica, it turns out to be very important the number of sample points that you use to construct a graph. This is much more important in three dimensions than in two, and that's because of the way Mathematica is constructing these images. So it samples a certain number of points per unit interval, and then it interpolates the surface from those. And what I mean by that is, once it has a bunch of sample points, it uses a spline method to smoothly connect all those pieces so that you get a smooth surface out the other side. When you don't give it enough interpolation points, it doesn't have anything to work with, and you start seeing inaccuracies and jagged edges. So if I give it a low number of sample points per interval or per unit, like five, this particular function has a lot of peaks in it, and so you end up with this really rough image here. Sharp points, it doesn't look like it's terribly well put together. Sines and cosines are supposed to be smooth. This doesn't look smooth at all. So a typical fix here would be to run lots of plot points. I admit when I ran 500 plot points here, this took a long time to compute. Uh, a couple of minutes, I think, to do the computation. Um, so let's zoom this in. But you can see that the image that you get out of this many points is much nicer. And in fact, you're capturing details here that you're not getting in the original image, like the fact that these these peaks are increasing as height as we, as we head out towards um, negative 6, negative 6. So contour plot 3D is a way of working with implicitly defined surfaces. And many of the most interesting surfaces are implicitly defined because you're not going to be able to do anything that wraps back around itself, like a, even a sphere, unless you're working implicitly. So contour plot 3D can take pretty complicated implicitly defined equations in and then produce pretty good looking graphs on the other side. I mean, this is a... This is kind of a neat shape because it's got a ball sitting inside of this weird pipe thing. So there's an entire hobby industry of people cooking up you know, new and interesting polynomials that they can feed into these sort of contour plot things and get cool surfaces out the other side. This is another place where you're, if you're interested in seeing more exotic surfaces or you want to work on things like topology or uh, you know, genus classification of these things, contour plot 3D is an interesting place to start with that. Um, you might want to know what this mesh none command is doing in here. What that does is it turns off the grid. So if you take that out, then you're going to get the grid, the flow lines that were used to construct the surface will show up. So the mesh, you can think of as the skeleton that's used to build the surface. 
All right, we have one topic left to cover. So finally, nearest and dearest to my own complex analyst heart is complex functions. So some of you may not have seen complex analysis before, but at least I'd like to point out that um, even as a very brief introduction, that Mathematica has got a very powerful set of tools for visualizing complex functions. In fact, the most difficult thing about complex functions is that you can't see them. You've got a function that takes in two real dimensional input and produces a two real dimensional output. And so it's very hard to visualize exactly how that's behaving. So the trick that um, complex analysts have come up with for understanding something about the behavior of complex functions is to plot both the input on the xy plane and something about the output on the same plane. So when we use something like complex plot for the function z squared, and you see this colorful image here, what we're looking at is uh, the angle of the output of the function. So we can see, actually by looking at this output right here, we can see that where that dot is in the middle, that all those colors are coming into. I know that the function z squared has a zero there because I can see that the colors change from yellow to red as I go counterclockwise. So the fact that I've got counterclockwise from yellow to red means that as this function does whatever it does, that it wraps around that point twice. That's why there's a, I can see from this image that this thing has a zero of order two at zero. You can also say the opposite of z squared and look at one over z squared. So one over z squared has the, I'm gonna just run 500 points here so I can get closer to the singularity. So one over z squared has an asymptote at zero instead. And what we see here is now the colors run from yellow to red, but in the clockwise direction. So it may be hard to tell without looking at this, but you see the colors go yellow and then green and then purple and then red in the upper picture, which is where Z was a zero. But we go from yellow to green to purple to red in the clockwise direction, in the case where we have one over Z squared. And again, it's doing it twice. And so if you've seen any complex analysis, this is uh, the what uh, a pole of order two looks like. You, what's actually going on here is that the argument is wrapping twice around the pole. So one of the weaknesses of these type of uh, arg plots or argument plots is that it doesn't tell us how the function is growing. So we're sort of using the, the human brain here in a way that we can plot four different pieces of information, but with only three physical dimensions. So when we do something like complex plot 3D, what we're doing is we're treating the xy plane as the input variable x plus iy. The z, that is the height of the surface, corresponds to the modulus or the magnitude of the complex variable that comes out. And the color tells us what the argument or angle of that complex number is. So when you're looking at a plot like this, you are looking at an xy input and a modulus so the surface just traces out how big the numbers that come out are, but the fact that we color the surface also gives us the additional information about the way that the angles are acting. So it's kind of a neat way of, of tricking math, I guess, in some sense. So here we can tell that we've got a zero at z squared, so we sort of have this parabolic looking shape as we'd expect in magnitude. And if we flip that over the other way, we have a pole, which means it's an asymptote, which means that it heads off to infinity as we get closer and closer. And that's what we see when we do a complex plot 3D of that function. So if you're more interested in learning about what's going on here, there's a lot of resources about this, uh, including in a very nice textbook at the maybe second course in complex analysis level. If you've never seen complex analysis before, just keep this in mind that there's a powerful set of tools for analyzing and working with complex functions in Mathematica and that there are a lot of tricks for visualizing what they look like. So that's graphics. Go to it. Make me some pretty pictures and I'll see you guys for maybe the most important part of the whole course so far, which is solving equations. Mostly what people want to do with mathematical software most of the time. All right. See you next time.